Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama uh, and, and a few others decided they would overthrow the Syrian government in 2011, typical regime change operation. That's what created the war and the refugees. Did any single European leader say that, explain that to the public? Not one. So then they wonder, why is their popularity so low? Well, if you don't speak up the truth, what do you expect? And so understand that these hegemonic wars of the United States, these are not in Europe's interests. And, uh, and, and that's the same with supporting what Israel is doing in Gaza. It's not a matter of right or left. It's a matter of what's Europe's interest right now. It is not to have a fulminant Middle East war right now. So how do you create this miracle? Because even the possible uh, alternative to Biden is Trump or somebody from the Republican. They are in certain aspects even more radical pro-Israeli than the Democrats. Uh, how to overcome this tiny problem? Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the pressure has to come from inside the United States and from outside. Uh, from inside, public opinion absolutely does not accept the administration line on this. This is very clear in opinion survey after opinion survey. So somebody in the White House uh, concerned about uh, Biden's reelection must be reading this uh, and must be understanding this is just purely bad tactics from a U.S. political point of view. That's very important. Uh, there's lots of protest in the United States uh, and uh, lots of uh, unhappiness with this. So we're not in any way locked in internally to the politics. It's bad for Biden. Uh, it's bad for U.S. interests. Uh, it's against public opinion. Um, and so this is uh, one point that I would make. It's not like the United States is rousing support. Yes, and it's impossible to turn. Uh, it's actually deeply contested and mainly opposed. Though so I acknowledge that in Washington, the pro-Israel lobby has always been very powerful. The military industrial complex is very powerful and the inertia is also powerful. So I'm not saying it's easy. Now on the outside, the entire world uh, is basically aligned on this side with one important footnote, which is that uh, a few European countries uh, maybe are not aligned. I don't know what the Austrian government's real position is. Sometimes it's uh, don't you know, side with the U.S. or maybe it really is uh, because of more right wing uh, view or whatever uh, side with Israel. But it's very few. The problem in Europe is European politicians stop telling the truth about almost anything years ago because all they want to do is side with the United States. And mm -hmm. I think I would just say to European politicians, if you do it, you lose at the polls. There isn't a popular government in Europe right now that it, because it's incredible. This is so much against European, Europe's own political interests. So I would say, think through this honestly, and then say, you know, it's right. We need, we're not against Israel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just need to move to a two-state solution, and the United States, you know, come over here, buddy. You know it too. Let's let's move to a real solution. I'm waiting for European politicians to regain two feet on the ground, their head out of the clouds or out of uh, U.S. control, and just state clearly, straightforwardly what is right and also what happens to be in Europe's interests, but by the way, what happens to be in Israel's interests as well, because nothing that's happening is uh, doing anything other than gravely threatening 
Israel's long-term survival. This messianism, this greater Israel idea, this zealotry of this religious group, this is not saving Israel. This is threatening Israel's survival. So I want European leaders just to think clearly and honestly about this, because that'll also help the United States get to the right place. I think there is a lot to say about the European leaders. I think the, the European leaders, uh, uh, there are no leaders, you, you know it better. And there is another tiny problem. We will have also an election this year in some European countries, uh, but in the European Union for the European Parliament. And the problem is that everybody, if according to most of the polls, it's to foresee that the right-wing uh, European nationalistic right-wing parties will win. And the problem is they are even at least Concerning Israel, they are also in the meantime, also many of their parties, if to go back history, you know where they come from. And this is a historic cynicism. I think that these right-wing uh, fascist parties, now they are on side of Israel, which is yeah. unbelievable for anybody who knows history and who knows how things uh, happened that these parties who are sometimes in internal uh, issues, they are racistic, they are fascist to it right today. But when it comes to Israel, they are supporting the Jewish state. Yeah, you know, su supporting the Jewish state is, uh, um, is one thing. Supporting what is called greater Israel to dominate the Palestinians is so uh, senseless for Israel and for Europe uh, that uh, everybody should take a deep breath and understand that. How many self wounds does Europe want? How many crises, how many wars does Europe want around it? Uh, and I would ask uh, the European leaders, you know, th the reason why the right is growing is in part because the so-called center or center left all was gung ho with the United States for NATO enlargement and for the war in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, it's been a disaster for Europe. It's been a disaster economically for Europe. It's been a disaster from a security point of view for Europe. So it's not even left right. It's it's a failure policy that the current European governments have pursued, and they are opening up their way for an opposition to arise. Uh, and that's that's what's happening, in fact. So the reason European politicians, by the way, across the board, you, you look at the approval ratings in Western Europe right now or in the EU, nobody has any support, basically, except the few that stand up for themselves, like Orban or, uh, or Fico or uh, mm -hmm. a, a few others. But the ones that are basically just siding with the United States in this useless Ukraine war are all in their 20% approval ratings or 25% approval ratings and so on. So the main point I would say to Europe is if you go the way not of supporting Israel, that's one thing, but supporting greater Israel for ethnic cleansing and for this terrible thing, all you're doing is making another prolonged disaster on Europe's borders. And if that's in Europe's interest, boy, please explain it to me. This is this is no doubt about it. I think uh, Europe, I think with this uh, policy they, they uh, followed the last uh, tens of years, I think they, it's against their own security, economic, even cultural interests. I think this is something uh, which- You know, I'll give you another example, by the way. Uh, the, the, the politics of the 2010s was dominated uh, by the Syrian refugees. And anyone that knows even the slightest history should understand that uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama uh, and, and a few others decided they would overthrow the Syrian government in 2011, typical regime change operation. 
That's what created the war and the refugees. Did any single European leader say that, explain that to the public? Not one. So then they wonder, why is their popularity so low? Well, if you don't speak up the truth, what do you expect? And so understand that these hegemonic wars of the United States, these are not in Europe's interests. And, uh, and, and that's the same with supporting what Israel is doing in Gaza. It's not a matter of right or left. It's a matter of what's Europe's interest right now. It is not to have a fulminant Middle East war right now. And so European politicians should think about how to defuse a Mideast wide war. You are, you are completely right. I think you convince uh, people like me, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> we are not in, uh, in power. And, uh, uh, but coming back to uh, the issue of this uh, uh, interview, I think now there is a, a, a peace plan it's even economically, we didn't even mention it, but uh, which is interesting for me, since you are uh, uh, also uh, long experienced in economy, I think um, one uh, important, but not so much debated uh, uh, proposal is uh, the establishment of a new UN fund. Uh, uh, UN Reconstruction and Sustainable Development Fund, which, which is uh, interesting, should partially, at least partially, funded by reduction of expenses which traditionally have been spent for armament and war. You know, uh, uh, outside the UN, across the street uh, from uh, headquarters, is what they call Isaiah's Wall, uh, which is the inscription of uh, the prophet Isaiah, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, uh, which says, uh, they uh, shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Uh, nations uh, will not uh, uh, make war uh, uh, on uh, other nations, neither will they teach war anymore. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, you know, Isaiah had the idea in the eighth century BCE of the uh, transforming the military to the civilian use, uh, and uh, we're now spending two and a half trillion dollars a year worldwide on the military. The United States is around forty percent of the world spending shocking because we're four percent of the world's population uh what if we take even 10 percent of that would be 200 billion dollars a year uh so two and a half uh, i'm sorry 250 billion a year uh and so that's the proposal uh create a fund funded by uh basically uh, agreed cutbacks in armaments I should mention that uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, in his encyclical uh, Populorum Progressio in uh, 1967, had that idea. So I don't want to claim uh, any uh, uh, any uh, uh, precedence uh, to this, but I do think it's the right idea. The UN in general does not command much in financial resources. Uh, it needs to have a bigger budget to do good things. And uh, one way would be military cutbacks that are rechanneled to sustainable development. We could continue hours and hours and hours since uh, many things have been already uh, discussed uh, for many years. But it's interesting that now this plan is here. I think, uh, do you have any uh, ideas how to make it even more popular? Do you uh, intend to present it to other international bodies? Uh, and how should this come to reality? I'm uh, discussing uh, these ideas with UN diplomats uh, all the time. Uh, and I've discussed it with the uh, Palestinian uh, diplomats and with diplomats from around uh, the Middle East. Um, there's a lot of resonance with this. I personally am continuing to urge an immediate membership of Palestine in 
the UN uh, as a UN member state. Um, by the way, Palestine is a state recognized by 140 uh, other states, but it is not recognized as a UN member state, uh, only an observer, as you rightly pointed out. So I am continuing my own discussion of this, um, basically uh, with the US government, they don't talk to me too much, uh, but I uh, try to make my views uh, known uh, publicly uh, by uh, writing and posting uh, articles all the time. Um, and uh, I'm writing to politicians in the US who are quite resistant in general because uh, uh, their modus operandi for decades has been never show any, any space at all with Israel. But I'm telling them it's not working. Uh, it's not working from any point of view. You need to rethink this. So they have a few days of rethinking before the Congress uh, comes back. Uh, the White House cannot be uh, very comfortable. We hear lots of stories about pretty harsh talks between the U.S. and Israel right now. I believe that that's true. One of the U.S. Uh, carrier groups <coughs> has been withdrawn from the Eastern Mediterranean and is on its way back to the U.S., that is a signal that the U.S. does not want a wider war in the Middle East. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. The U.S. is exhausted of war and an election year. Uh, it would uh, be the end of uh, Biden's chances at all. So uh, this is the time for pushing the politics because it's a case where the right thing to do the politically expedient thing to do uh, are the same. Uh, and so I'm going to continue to push hard on that. Do you have any hope in, I think you mentioned it and everybody knows it, I think two thirds of the international uh, states are in favor of this kind of political and economic uh, solution, unfortunately, uh, they don't have any veto uh, at the UN. But there is something else. There is an uh, increasing number of states working together, I think. Uh, and the South African move to the international court is interesting because South Africa, on the other side, is one of the leading uh, member states of this newly established group, the BRICS uh, group. Uh, so. And they have even already established a kind of new banking system, financing system. Do you have any indications or ideas that from this side, uh, more than just political statements will come to support your suggestions? Well, the, the BRICS countries, all of them are on the same side that I've been advocating, uh, China, Russia. Uh, South Africa, uh, India has expressed uh, also uh, some clarity on this, um, Brazil certainly, um, and now you have new BRIC states that have just joined, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, the Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and Iran. It's a powerful group. Uh, they're all on uh, this side. Uh, actually, it's interesting for me, the fact that Iran is now a BRICS member is, is actually going to moderate uh, Iran, make it uh, part of what could be a BRICS-wide consensus uh, on uh, a good solution. So this matters because uh, the U.S. also looks out and says, you know, our diplomacy, we're isolated, whereas China's and Russia's diplomacy is growing in the region. This cannot make anyone happy, and we know that in the U.S. State Department, there's a lot of unhappiness about the U.S. administration policy. We don't hear all the details, but it boils over uh, every few weeks. And so we hear about the protests coming from inside the professional diplomatic service of the United States as well. So I wouldn't give up uh, in any way on uh, a political change where the United States one day says, you know, we, we need to move forward to a real solution here. Uh, this is uh, where I think uh, uh, it's very appropriate and timely to think straight. And if the European leaders are too afraid to say it in public, they should be saying it, they should be saying it in private to their American counterparts. 
they should. Yeah. So I think it's time. I think we exceeded a little bit our usual limit. So thank you very much, Professor Sachs. I think it was very interesting. It's important. And I think we should really invest more and more time to publish these ideas and maybe even outside the usual normal circles we have in New York, in Brussels, uh, because the world is much bigger and in the long run more, more or less more powerful than the world which runs the business till now, but it will come to an end. And the Palestinian-Israeli issue could be, we forgot something, because the Palestinian issue, what is it in, in history? It's a colonial problem. It, it's it's it. one it's one of the last unsolved colonial problems, and it's more than hundred years after formerly colonialism was ended. It's time to deal with the remaining rests, and Israel Palestine is one, and this should be uh, one of our ambitions to 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 put this forward. Absolutely. This is uh, right, and uh, it makes it uh, possible to solve also. Thank you very much, and all the best. To Bye. you too. Talk okay. to you soon. Bye-bye.